were at dinner the other day, you, you said that much of the work of farming is really in observing. Mm. You also keep livestock. I know you keep sheep and pigs and um, understanding just a little bit about um, tending to sheep and keeping them as stock. Do you find or have you observed in your observations that there is something like an elder function amongst the sheep that the old use? Do they nurture the young in such a way that resembles something of what we're talking about in the human realm? Uh -huh. um, well, there are no teachers. <laughs> so the advent of teachers is not a naturally occurring event mm -hmm. in the uh, scheme of life, I would say. They're practitioners. And you could say the ones you're referring to are the, the kind of deepened incarnation of sheepness. And that's what they drag around. That's what they are. And their particular achievedness is to be in the last five minutes of their life. I mean, the mature of anything is five minutes to midnight. The blossom that everybody admires so desperately is the end. And even though flowers are universally looked at as the youth of everything, but they're not. They're, by the time the blossom is there, it's all but finished. And by the time kind of the adamant sheepness of a particularly achieved sheep is there, they're all but done. Because they've acquired that during the course of all their comings and goings and watching the slaughter of some of their kin and, and uh, you know, making it through the winters and uh, all, all the other things that contribute to their capacity to incarnate that thing that I'm calling sheepness, you know. And so they don't teach, uh, nor do they lead in any obvious sense that we would recognize. Simply they, they have exhausted all the other possibilities and they've reduced to being sheep. <laughs> the very thing that humans will not tolerate. Mm -hmm. All the other possibilities are extinguished. Now you have to be a person. That's all that's left. Uh, but the sheep don't seem to be um, um, feel belittled by being sheep. And so they don't settle for it. They settle into it, maybe. So the early, the first year mothers are pretty skittish as a rule, and they're not that good at it. And you can see it. But you don't have mature ewes coming over to them and, you know, what you would hope is some kind of movie of the week kind of moment where you see this kind of tutorial going on or nothing of the kind. Because the fundamental responsibility of the youth of everything is to pay attention, not to be instructed, to pay attention. I'll never forget, I want to learn how to make uh, birch bark canoes. And there was an Algonquin man, native guy, at the end of the lake where I lived, who was still making them, miracle of miracles. And so one day I'm, I'm working alongside him, and he made me buy the canoe. And he said, no discount. Yeah, yeah cool. So anyway, we're working together, and I think, I'm about as lucky as it's possible to be. I'm like, I'm going to throw up. I'm so fortunate here, you know, and I'm going away and I'm, and I'm watching him doing. And finally, I ask him the ultimate white guy question. I didn't know it at the time, but that's exactly what it was. I said, uh, Stanley, uh, why are you doing that thing like that? And he didn't look up, just kept right doing it. He answered me, though. He said, oh, he said, old Indian trick. That was his answer. I sat there and I thought, of course, at some level, I thought, what an asshole. Like, it's a perfectly legitimate question. Why did you? It's a perfectly legitimate white guy question from a white guy who claims he wants to learn, but doesn't want to learn. He wants to be instructed. And he wants the super highway towards the skill and the capacity to do it available to him simply by virtue of appearing. Just a little arrogant, no? Just a little. But of course, all this is lost upon me. Because I think I'm a good guy. Because I'm respecting him and all the rest. But any question that begins with why is seeing to it that you have no respect for learning. You want to be instructed. You don't want to make mistakes. You don't want to go the long way. You don't want to go the route. You want to get it right. Because you come from an educational system that rewards getting the right answer as quickly as possible. No regard for learning whatsoever. So, it stung, you see. 
And I live with that sting like the rest of the day. And I never forgot it. I'm not sure that I asked another why question again. I don't think I did. And I'm not saying I instantly was converted to the understanding I'm speaking from now. Mm -hmm. But somewhere in there, I learned, don't ask any more why questions. And then I had to figure out why. And slowly I become educated, you know, by virtue of biting my tongue and not getting satisfied. And then we're right towards the end of the canoe. This is maybe uh, two months later. And I'm doing something and I can feel his eyes on me. I mean, there was maybe 20 words that passed between us during the course of any working day. It wasn't heavy on instruction. And then, miracle of miracles, what did he ask me? He said, uh, hey, he said, uh, why are you doing it like that? My God, there is a God, you see. And God has given me this moment. I didn't look up. I just kept working. I said to him, oh, Stanley, this old white guy trick, he said. Then I looked over and he went like this. And then he went back to it, you know. And I think somewhere in there he remembered, you know, and he might have got a bit of a chuckle over that, you know. But anyway, all of this is to say that uh, I claimed to want to learn how to make birch bark canoes, but I re all I really wanted to do was know how to make one. That's what I really wanted. And I had to realize all that. I don't think there's a sheep equivalent to a moment like that because sheep don't have the various out clauses on being sheep that humans exercise about being human. So it's an amazing tutelage, you know, to watch them unerringly sheep their way through their days. Mm -hmm. It's amazing. It's ama I mean, I don't mean to sound like Francis of Assisi or anything like that, and I'm not, but I can tell you this, if you're willing to, quote, learn from them, they won't instruct you but they will sure show you something about fidelity and the willingness to be limited in all the range of possible life forms to be that wool-bearing, split-hoofed variety. And they're remarkably good at it. The other half of the story, though, is you, um, you keep sheep. Um, you've put them in harm's way no matter how skillful and how compassionate and how sustainable and friggin' Steinerish and so on and so on, you might be. Why? Because you've interfered with that which most deeply guarantees their health, that's why, and their well-being, which is what? You feed them. Yeah, but it's not food that sustains any life form's principal um, life. Well, what is it then if it's not food? It's whatever underwrites their health. And in the case of sheep, historically, it's been the predator. It's been the wolf or the coyote. And the wolf and the coyote sees to the health of the herd, the flock. Sees to it. Well, you know how. Everybody knows how, ostensibly, by eliminating the ones that birth and genetics do not favor, right? And the lame and the sick and the old and so forth. Nobody's old in a, in a flock or a herd out there. Nobody is. And nobody should be in a domestic herd either. Because what you've done by domesticating is interfering with what guarantees their health while claiming to care for them. So you have to care for them in a way that's so counterintuitive because it doesn't conserve them individually. It serves their health instead, which is to say, you have to take up the work of the wolf, the one that you banished with your fences and your dogs. And, and the, you have to take it up. That as a human, that is your psychic and spiritual responsibility. Because if you, if you deliver on the claim that you hold them in high regard, mm -hmm. sheep, then the way of holding them in high regard is to reinstate what preserves their health. And you do that in the fall by culling from the flock those disadvantaged by DNA and inheritance and the weak and the sick and the lame and the aged. That's what you do. And those are grievous days when you come to it with this understanding.
is not a sense of you're finally reaping your reward or you wake up every day knowing what you're going to do all day long and that life is going to leave this world through your hands. But if you don't have that in you, you know, stick to carrots. But it's no different with carrots. You put, it's the same. When you're thinning, it's the same. It's the same. So, so these things are really active and, and there, you know, and I suppose if there are sheep elders, they're not elders because they've been around a long time. But uh, in a domestic flock, I think one of the things that, that might make elders amongst that flock is them watching the extraordinary contortions that humans go through, trying to figure out how to be, do right by them. That might deepen their sheep wisdom. Mm. Just a guess. Just as we trying to do right by them and watching how they are with each other, our capacity to be elders might be deepened as well. And that might be a strange reciprocity that's in the domesticating arrangement, which all the rewilding people miss completely because they demonize domestication. They don't know what they're looking at, my humble uh, estimation. Mm -hmm.